Well, good afternoon, everybody. And by good afternoon, I mean good morning. It's late Friday morning here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Thank you for joining us today. We are broadcasting live. Keeping an eye on the chat and seeing if anybody can hear me. And if we're five by five, then we will roll and we will roll and we will roll. Brandon and Eric and Doug say five by five. So does Jandra. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Let's keep the title slide on here for just a second. Do earthquakes give a damn? Deciphering valley damming landslides in the Pacific Northwest. I hope that you enjoy this talk. Thank you so much for remembering to join us without a whole lot of publicity as well. We have 180 folks with us and more will be rolling right in. Let me get on camera here and say hi to a few of you. Happy New Year, everybody, especially if you haven't been with us with the uh, Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series, which has been going on. If I haven't seen you in a while, thank you. Maybe you're just a fan of these Friday noon talks, and that's all that you consume. Regardless, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for being with us. Can I say hi to a few of you? We continue to just see, and by the way, if you're watching this in replay, uh, this lecture will begin in 12 minutes. So I'll put a chapter title right at the beginning of Logan's talk so that you can skip right ahead. If you're watching this in replay, you can bounce right to the next chapter title. Otherwise, I'm live here with uh, 180 folks. Where are you doing from today? We have a a small group so far, but they are loud. We got we got social animals in the room, which is strongly encouraged. Not all the folks in the department are social animals. That's a good that's that's a compliment, by the way. <laughs> Garrett, the Dutch not owl from the Netherlands, downtown Seattle, Christchurch, New Zealand, Memphis, Tennessee. Hey, Chris, remember to come to the lecture. By the way, he's staring right through me right now. But Chris, the geology's major is. Very excited about today's talk. He's been thinking about it for the last three days. Zoltan is from Budapest, Hungary. Don is in Dayton, Ohio. Letha Lee. Hello, Letha Lee. Marysville, Washington. Cincinnati, Ohio. Austin, Texas. Forest Grove, Oregon. Uh, there will be a plenty of Oregon, I think, in today's talk. Austin, Texas. Bitterroot Valley, Montana. Frankfort, Southern Illinois. Deborah is in San Jose, uppercase, exclamation point. Martin's in Yushiping, Sweden. Owasso, Oklahoma. Black Lake, New Mexico. Philomath, that's Kirk, in Siletsia land. Boulder Creek, California. Port Ing, Port Ing, Wisconsin. Derbyshire, UK. The mic sounds great. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, these are new microphones that are broadcast by road. This lecture brought to you by Road Microphones. You've got to love it. Reno, Nevada. Tualatin, Oregon. Tualatin, Oregon again. Edith and Brian, do you know each other? You're living, you're both watching live from Tualatin, Oregon. <coughs> Chad is a geologist. I recognize your name, Chad. Hello from Tucson, Arizona. White Salmon, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Brian is still on vacation. He's a University of New Mexico student, he, he informs us. Dennis is in sunny Tucson. Jealous. Winter Gardens, California. Leavenworth, Washington. Sorry, Nick. Port Wing, Wisconsin. That's okay, Andy. We all make mistakes. I make them every hour on the hour. Uh, we got more and more folks coming in. That's a good thing. And uh, I think I'm going to test my cameras real quick with you all. And in a few minutes, we will... I'll put another mic on our speaker, Logan, and see if you can hear him. But if it's been a while, or if you're, if you're brand new to these Friday noon talks, this is uh, the geology department here at Central Washington University, all of us, um, undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty, staff. Uh, a few townies are here. Uh, Rachel from Plain, Washington, who usually is in the live chat with these programs. She drove down today. It's a beautiful day. We actually have sun. I'm looking forward to getting outside and seeing some of the sun. Hannah's visiting with John Lasher, and they've got a new project uh, proposal for the Goat Rocks Volcano. 
and I will, along with everybody else, announce the rest of the noon talks happening this winter quarter. We have four more lectures in addition to today. Can I ask one more time, are we doing okay with just me before I swing you around? Are we five by five with my microphone and my camera? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Let's focus in on Chris. That's Chris. <laughs> Bull number four. <laughs> You don't have to do that. Take some biology, take some biology classes. What you shouldn't do is take more biology classes. Than biology classes. Cool. I know about that one. I've been doing biology class, but I have been recently. What a nerd. <laughs> You're reading a science paper during a social hour? What's your name? What's your social security number? Nick Zentner. Your name is Nick Zentner? Or Ned Zinger, sorry. <laughs> Ned Zinger. <laughs> it's going well. Thanks for coming. Yeah. 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 Tough decisions. Yeah. 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 MRI tonight. Um, yeah. Still bugging me. We'll see how bad it is. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Hopefully you can. Yeah. So, so we'll see. This is Rachel, who's in from Plain, uh, north of uh, Leavenworth, and this is Carl Lilquist. He's a geography professor here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Good. You guys got great seats. Yeah. The best okay. Well, slightly to the right of the best in the house. Of the oh, look at this guy. Get his bony ass off the thing. No, look at him. Uh, yeah. the company. <laughs> uh, four. That's what Lisa was telling me was one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going to put a mic on you on me. in two minutes. Two minutes. Yep. <laughs> Joshua, how are you doing, man? Good to see you around. Hannah Shamlin, am I announcing something about Cornerstone? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Haven't made the reservation yet because they're not open. But Fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Am I making an announcement about forms? Um, yeah, you can plan it all into it. I'm doing for Okay. And they don't? Yeah. Okay, good. Any other announcements of any sort? Just request the best. Yeah, exactly. That's all. We don't care about numbers. Just don't give us that. Yeah, don't give us some crap. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? Okay. Let's give you some screen time. It does, by the way. 
Hey, home viewers, uh, I'm looking at your live comments. We're going to put a microphone on uh, Logan, our speaker. And can you uh, put in five by five about Logan, if you can hear Logan talking to uh, Hannah Shambo? Thanks. Okay. All right. This thing's hot. All right. And I think you're kind of a loud voice, and you're yeah. going to be kind of projecting yeah. anyway. So maybe we'll come down All right. this far. That's probably good. I have the list though, which kind of adds to a little bit of a challenge for the listeners. <laughs> I'm going deaf, that's why. Thank you. <laughs> they can hear you. They can hear me. Oh, that's good. So nice to meet everybody. I'll start in about two minutes, and right. yeah, they'll be able to hear you, so don't say anything <laughs> too cool. raunchy. Right? Be cool. Be cool. Be cool for a change. All right. And uh, I'll do my usual announcements, yep. and we'll get right to you. Sounds okay, good. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I better step away, then. <laughs> Happy New Year. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. I think I saw you once the entire fall quarter walking to Carl's class or whatever. Yeah. I'm busy me sometimes. I don't know how to find you. Okay. That's on me. I got Sorry. a name on which one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, Which man. one Happy feels New better? Year. I don't know. Hey, you guys. <laughs> Thanks for coming. A little bit higher. <laughs> hey, man. How's it going? Yeah. How are you? Thank you for coming. I do. Of course. This is your spot. Like, we should rope this off. Like, nobody sits Could here. You, can I be dazzled? <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> Is this my moment to actually speak to you since you've been back? I just washed my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Happy New Year. We got a lot to get we caught do. up on, Mr. Jordan. I Perry. saw you like every other day, right before, and then it's just been vacancy. Have you been keeping up with the series? I got a little behind. I'm. I've watched three in the last week. And I'm behind. I'm up to. I've watched Joel's. I've watched Puget Sound Glaciers. Good. I think I watched just the first few that sound, the pre, yeah. the pre Brett's one, and now yeah. it's going to be while well, Brett's is there. Yep. With Bailey Lewis. All right. It's good. Thank you. It's really good. A lot. I, yeah. Every time I'm blown away yeah, keep it entertaining. by how they can help you. Totally. Like the, the German guy? Yes. With the trains? Yes. I was just like beating that up. It was so cool. <laughs> yeah. Totally right. Thank you. I'm glad I recorded that. That was perfect. Okay, everybody. Hannah is so tiny. That is so true. Mm -hmm. I'm kidding. Sure. I'm so down with it. I'm down. I'll join you. <laughs> yeah, Brandon, thank you. Five by five. I appreciate that very much. Lots of animals. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, we're back. After a two-month hiatus, we are back. Thank you so much. We've got a full room. I don't know, like 15 minutes ago, there was just a few people in here. So like it would be wonderful to get some of you down out of your offices before the very last moment. You know, we got a whole social hour next. What am I doing? I'm shaming you as soon as we start. I don't know. I don't know what am I what am I doing? But 
there's lots going on, and those that are coming out of their offices and emerging and mixing uh, is, is particularly uh, positive, especially in these dark winter days. Hey, we got Jeff from Bimmons Bakery right here. You got to love it. All right. So um, a few kind of housekeeping items. We'll announce the uh, lectures that are on the schedule for this winter series, and then we'll turn it over to our speaker, Logan Weatherall. I'm sure that you will enjoy this talk. Housekeeping first, that's Bree McGinnis in the back. She's the department chair, and she says, if you have not signed paperwork this year so far to give permission to be on camera for this half of the room, or if you prefer to stay off camera and stay over there in that corner, we need you guys to see Bree as well, to sign some paperwork so that this is all um, okay with everybody uh, in the university. And Bree is also teaching 304 slash 504 this quarter. And so you need to visit with Bree after the lecture if you haven't seen her yet about 504 slash 304. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at recommending the back of your head. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Logan is going to speak at noon. That's why you're here. There is an opportunity to visit with Logan downtown and others. Hannah, what's the story? Three o'clock this afternoon, Cornerstone Pizza, down there next to Safeway. We're going to reserve a table for 10 or whatever. You are, everyone's welcome to come down. Welcome to come down and share a table with us and enjoy some pizza and beer and everything else. Um, so please put that on your calendar. And that will be the routine for most of these talks. If you're surprised by that, especially when we have guests from out of town, we make sure to take them downtown and treat them to whatever. So uh, even when we have in-house guests like today and this winter, we have a number of people who are uh, in Ellensburg because normally it's tough to travel this time of year. I guess it hasn't been so tough so far. Uh, so today we're going to hear from Logan Weatherall. That's January 5th. We do not have a talk next Friday because it's a three-day weekend. So nothing's happening next Friday. The following Friday, however, January 19th, Kelly Wall from the United States Geological Survey in the Cascade Volcano Observatory will be here. She's giving a talk called Construction of an Andesite Factory, the Three Million Year Evolution of the Goat Rocks Volcanic Complex. That's Kelly Wall. January 26th, the following Friday, the last Friday in January, Susan Kaspari, professor here. Susan will be speaking. My year as a Fulbright scholar in Norway, exploring the dust deposition on Svalbard glaciers and advancing sustainability, advancing sustainability in teaching. That's Susan Kaspari. February 9th, another CWU geology staff member, Marie Takach, will speak to mix or not to mix details and timing of a magma storage, recharge, and eruption at Misty Volcano, Peru. Then we take a few Fridays off, and there's a new date. We've moved to Friday, March 1st, as opposed to the... Susan, was it just the... the we, so we moved uh, Anthony Schoen's geothermal talk back one week. So March 1st is the, is the new date. Friday, March 1st, Anthony Schoen from Spokane will be coming over giving a talk called Electrifying CWU's Heating System with Geothermal Energy. So that's the Lit Language and Lit Building Project. And uh, so he's a, a key player in that, as well as Susan uh, herself. Okay, we're getting settled in. We're ready for the talk today. I have one more quick announcement. I've tried to work with IT people to get these speakers to work well with a microphone to, to amplify the voices in the room. And apparently that's not possible. <laughs> and so um, if you are having a hard time hearing some of our speakers, I don't think you'll have a hard time today, but if you, if you, if you, if you normally have a hard time hearing the speakers, Come on, man. You can sit in the very front row. You can sit next to Jordan. He's hygienic. You can just <laughs> fill in the front couple of rows. It's okay. You'll be on camera. Oh, fine. But you'll be able to hear and see quite well. I'll dim the lights just slightly, but I like to keep the lighting up so that we can amplify uh, and light the speaker properly. So today's speaker is a native of Umpqua, Oregon. That's near Roseburg, Oregon. He did his undergrad at University of Oregon in Eugene, and he came to Central Washington University to get a master's degree in geology, studying under Professor Lisa Ely. So the speaker today, do earthquakes give a damn? 
deciphering deep-seated landslide patterns across the Pacific Northwest. Would you please help me welcome Logan Weatherall. Hey. Well, this isn't very exciting right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get there, baby. You'll get there? All right. <laughs> well, all, most of you know me. I'm Logan Weatherall. I'm a guy who came to central Washington and then never kind of left. Um, same thing actually happened at the University of Oregon, too. I'm actually a research contractor for them also, uh, for the geomorphology department. Um, so I spend a lot of my time in landslide dammed lakes. And I'm going to tell you why landslide dammed lakes are important. First of all, they're really pretty. That's really nice to go bushwhack into, right? You go into this lake, you have these drowned trees in there. And those drowned trees, those are what are key for us for dating landslides, ancient landslides. And I'll get into that. But uh, first, I want to thank quite a few people. Um, this data that I'm going to be showing you is the compilation of a lot of people's work over the last few decades. Um, one of the big guys, actually, Pat Pringle. Uh, he has done a ton of work in Washington dating landslide dam lakes. Um, and so a lot of you'll be seeing a lot of his data. Uh, my friend, Sean Lahusen, he's with USGS. He does a lot of uh, surface roughness dating. I'll get into that later. Um, good friend, though. We have Allison Duvall at University of Washington. My other good friend, Will Struble. He's at University of Arizona now. Um, again, I brought it Pat. And then last, uh, Brian Black. He has dated almost all the landslides in the Pacific Northwest. He is a dendrochronologist. So we go out, we'll take a sample, and then we send it to him, and he's our expert. He can go through there and figure out when these trees died in those lakes. Um, a couple other very important people. Dr. Josh Roaring, he's put up with me for over a decade. He somehow finds money to pay me on occasion. Uh, Lisa Ely, great advisor right there. Um, she has done a great job at keeping me on track, one way to put it. And then of course, my wonderful wife, Dr. Megan Weatherall right there. Um, another person who's definitely kept me on track and doesn't mind when I bring home tree samples that are full of termites or wood ants and bring them inside. Yeah, so, so she also has to put up with me. So these are people that are very important in all this work. So, well, first off, we'll talk about why do we care about landslide dammed lakes? Um, how do we go about dating ancient lakes or ancient landslides for that fact? Um, and after we date all these different sites, what do we start figuring out as one of the primary causes in the Pacific Northwest uh, for our landslides? Are they coast seismic or are they, occurring mostly with precipitation. Um, and, then, uh, um, and then last, also after we have all this data, where do we want to start focusing our energy next? So start off, why do we care about landslide dam lakes and just landslides in general? They happen, they are deadly, they kill people. One of the most local or recent ones, we have the Osa landslide on the Stillaguamish River. Um, this killed 43, uh, took out 49 homes, and this is in 2014. Um, so that was a big deal when this occurred. And what people didn't realize also, this actually formed a lake behind it for a while. It blocked up the Stillaguamish River um, for about six to eight weeks, and then it actually slowly failed. We can see some houses over here that were buried. Um, they weren't involved with the landslide, but they were involved with the flooding upstream afterwards. Um, this actually rerouted the river too. It used to go this way and then it diverted itself. Um, and then... I have to start this off though too about why do I care? Already, already I brought up that this is a deadly hazard across the Pacific Northwest and mountainous areas, but why the hell do I care? So I'm a fifth generation Umpqua local from uh, the state of Jefferson. I was telling Nick, if anybody knows where that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I grew up playing on the Umpqua River and many others fishing and would see landslides happen all the time. In fact, I go up and play with my nephew still. And we go run up and down the creeks playing on debris flow deposits. Um, Another thing too, I've been down in Southern Oregon for a long time. This is the tallest Douglas fir tree. That's named after my grandpa. So we'd go visit that pretty regularly and there'd be roads washed out all the time. But this guy actually here plays a big role about why I care so much in landslides. So this is a photo from a few years ago with us playing on the Umpqua River. This is my friend, Sean Marvin. So I've known Sean since I was in kindergarten. Not too many people can say that they have friends since kindergarten. Um, we grew up out in the boonies. We rode the bus together. Ended up, uh, or excuse me. Sean lived about 35 miles away from town or so. And I was about 15, 20. And my bus ride every day, we would have to go past his house. 
And we drop off Sean up Hubbard Creek out in the boonies and then go and drop me off. So second grade was a big flood year for us, 1996. Um, we stopped dropping Sean off and a few others off at their house. We started dropping them off at neighbors down below the road. Um, and so we dropped Sean off and we're in second grade. So I'm not thinking anything of it. It's a flood year. I don't know what's going on. I'm in second grade paint playing like Pokemon blue, I think. Um, and then one afternoon or evening, actually, we get a phone call. Uh, my dad was part of the volunteer fire department and there was oh, multiple people dead. Multiple people were missing in a landslide that had started up Hubbard Creek. Um, this had killed four, including my friend Sean Marvin's mom, um, orphaned two kids. The Moon family was taken out. A neighbor was actually killed. Um, and this debris flow, so this is the bus stop. This is where we turn around every day, drop Sean off and others, and then go off and then drop me off at home. So this, this, excuse me, this landslide started up at a logging landing, way up on this ridge on Rock Creek. It took off as just a small slide, but it gained momentum and it gained material as it went down the steep ravine, bringing in more and more trees and rocks. And it traveled for over a mile before it was deposited. And in the way was the Moon family's residence. So uh, Rick and uh, Sharon uh, Moon, they were in their house cleaning it out along with my friend, Sean Marvin's mom. Um, she was in the house. Another neighbor was walking up to help clean it out when the landslide, the debris flow came through and took them out. Went in the front door of Sean Marvin's house, right in the front yard, um, but missed their residence. So in second grade, we get on the bus the next day and Sean's still on the bus with us. And it was a moment as a child where you start to realize like, shit, something serious happened. Um, and so over the years, I talked with Sean about this and things and he's grown to accept that his dad's probably gonna die up here. I talked to him about these landslide hazards. Um, but as a kid, we, this was the bus stop turnaround. Every day we'd turn around right there and I would look at that landslide deposit. And one interesting thing that struck out to me, it's kind of a little side note, the mailman survived. He was carried in the landslide deposit up near the Marvin residence all the way down. Um, and Sean always told me they found the mailman in a tree. And as a kid, you're like, what the hell do you mean they found him in a tree in a mail jeep? This doesn't make sense. So debris flows have something called inverse grading where when you look at a landslide deposit, what happens, all the small material ends up at the bottom, kind of acting as a liquid, and it ends up lifting up a lot of the boulders and bigger material to the top. So in a set, essentially, his mail Jeep was the biggest class around, and that allowed him to be carried in with all the trees and things and be deposited in the top of the landslide. Um, so this is why I care about landslides. I think about my Sean, I see him pretty often. My friend Sean, I talk to him pretty often. Um, and this brings us up to the human factor in the United States. So depending on precipitation patterns and things, we look at about 25 to 50 people die a year due to landslides. In the United States, we see over a million dollars a year in damage. Um, and globally, I mean, we have thousands of deaths and many billions in damages annually. Um, so just bringing up the, uh, the damages to infrastructure here, uh, keep note of this slide, the Huskanandan, Huskanandan slide, Highway 101, this took out uh, the highway for quite a while out of Brookings a few years ago. Um, but I'll come back to this slide later. Um, so in the Pacific Northwest, long-term landslide data is pretty limited. We're not like Italy where people have been here for thousands of years. They have a literally thousands of years record of landslides in the area. Here, we have hundreds. And we don't have a ton of earthquakes here on record either, um, especially modern. We uh, uh, 1700 subduction zone earthquake, that's the last one we had here. Nobody, we didn't observe this. We don't know how many landslides occurred at that time. Yet we go all over the coast range and we will find just big boulders. These are house sized boulders in these landslide deposits. And it kind of makes you wonder, are these coast seismic? What made something that large rupture? Um, so a big question is, is, what should we expect during the next earthquake in the Pacific Northwest? Um, so with this study, was looking at, do we see more floods or do we start seeing earthquakes in the record that produce landslides in the Pacific Northwest? And then just in extra as a fluvial question too, um, landslides are one of the primary ways you put sediment into a stream system. So if you have a lot of landslides during an earthquake, all that sediment is then rapidly going into the streams and you're having aggradation at those times. So are we looking at, from a fluvial perspective, um, big change in the sedimentation also um, due to these landslides. 
So we know landslides happen in earthquakes across the globe. Um, in China, the uh, Wenchuan, I can't say it right, uh, uh, earthquake saw about 200,000 landslides. Kaikoura in New Zealand saw about 100,000. In California, during the Northridge earthquake, they saw about 11,000 slides on these slopes here. Um, so we know earthquakes produce landslides, right? So what does the data here, though, show in the Pacific Northwest? So here we are above a landslide deposit, beautiful scarp. This one's fresh uh, on the coast. This is my dogs. We'll be talking about more of them, lots more. Um, or sorry, they're my scale bar, actually, really, for most of these photos. Nessie and, Nessie and Jelly there. Great photo. Thank you. So what data, though? We don't really have much long-term data here in the Pacific Northwest. Landslides are a tough thing to date. Um, and we, our historical records only goes back 100, 200 years maybe at most. So when do we start getting into uh, potential subduction zone generated earthquakes? Um, little side note on this. So this is Devil's Den. This is only a couple miles from where I grew up. This is one of the only landslides I know you can repel into and go crawl around in. So we took this more than 60 feet down and it's basically a straight crack. Whoops. A nice straight crack parallel and you can repel in there and we were doing it for science. Um, anyways, it goes more than 60 feet and that's about where our tiniest guy stopped and then ended up putting a tape measure down there and it went further till we hit more. So, But this is a very odd example of a landslide deposit. Usually they look more like this. So here we are back at the Huskanadin landslide. This is out at low tide, actually. Landslides are messy. We look at them when they occur, and you have all sorts of different material moving much different ways. Oh, I kind of cut out. We have boulonnage structures even in there. And you have a lot of, well, classic dikes, strike slip motion. But on occasion, we can find one little tree in there. Um, and that's the only thing we can really use to date these. So we. Most landslides, we have a pretty limited chance of preserving organics in there for radiocarbon dating, to try and date these landslides to figure out if they're related to an earthquake. One other issue, though, that I'll talk about, radiocarbon is not very precise in the last few hundred years, and I'll talk more about that. Um, so you're kind of looking, looking for a needle in a haystack uh, if you want to date an ancient landslide deposit. So here, this is what most of the time it looks like. You find a road cut, and you're like, oh, awesome, ancient landslide deposit. It's just a lot of junk in there. There's not a lot of organics. You don't have a real good way of dating this. You have a lot of random blocks, you have soil, but this is what most ancient landslides look like in the Oregon coast range. Very, very rarely will you come out there and be bushwhacking with your machetes, and then you hear a Eureka! And then Sean comes out and we take machetes around, cut around a little bit more, and then we find a tree that was killed in that landslide deposit. So this is a very rare exception to uh, work around on landslide deposits. Most of the time we need anoxic conditions. Otherwise, those trees are gonna to start to rot with time. So this is where landslide dam lakes come into this. We know trees exposed to anoxic conditions, soaked underwater, or soaked up a bunch of water, will last a very, very long time. And yeah, and this is where I come into play. I'm the guy that doesn't mind going and wading the lakes, bushwhacking in with a chainsaw, crawling in there, sometimes just in my undies, taking a sample out and uh, popping out for dating. Um, and right here is an example of what I mean, like we can have trees preserved for a very, very long time. This is one of my favorite sites to take folks to. There's jelly bean for scale. This tree is over 80,000 years old. So there is a way, this is past the point of radiocarbon dating. We couldn't radiocarbon date this. There is a wave cut terrace up there that was dated using a seashell layer to about 80,000 years at a, at a, a, a sea level high stand. And then sea levels dropped, tide worked its way in to the cliff face, and then exposed a series of multiple trees in there that were killed over 80,000 years ago. So this shows us that if we get into a landslide deposit in its anoxic conditions, like a lake, we can get trees preserved for a very, very, very long time. So, whoops. So landslide dam lakes, just like they sound. The landslide came down a creek, blocked it off, and it formed a dam. Makes sense. Um, in New Zealand, oh, what we have about 150 formed a few years ago during the Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, one of the issues when these landslide dam lakes form 
is that we have some secondary hazards. When that lake first fills up, it can spill over and then catastrophically fail. Or like we saw kind of with the Oso example, it will actually flood upstream. And if you have any people up there, it's a hazard um, for any infrastructure. Um, another local example we have here uh, is Quake Lake in Montana. So this was in 1959, this formed um, up on this ridge. We can see a big deep seated slide came down, boom, blocked off the creek and ended up drowning all these trees. So this is one of our few modern examples we have. A couple others I brought up, I brought up the Oso slide, but then the Nile River actually a few years ago backed up too during that landslide um, briefly before it finally down cut and, um, and incised through the landslide deposit. So we have a couple local examples. Oregon Coast Range, we have Ayers Lake. This is in a really wet winter. We have December 1975, Ayers Lake formed. These places are beautiful to go into, it's great. <laughs> so, but a lot of our other lakes that we have, we don't actually know when they form. So we're here. Uh, Pat Pringle and others have dated most of the stuff up in Washington. And then these are all the sites that I've sampled and uh, except for maybe a couple in there. So I've been, like, sorry, a lot. <laughs> Seen a lot of different lakes, bushwhacked into a lot of places, cussing and swearing, having a great time. Um, so this is our current, though, uh, um, inventory of landslides that we have dates for. So before we go about dating, I've kind of brought up radiocarbon, but radiocarbon, like I said, is not that great. Really what we want to do is dendrochronology. This is how we get really precise dates. This is how we can line up uh, one year to a uh, potential earthquake. Radiocarbon, we're going to get a range. So here we go in. So here's an example. This is Birchard Lake in the Oregon Coast Range. So Oregon Coast Range, I'll bring this up later. It's thought to be in steady state topography. The geomorphologist, that means it's uplifting as fast as it's eroding. So about 0.01 millimeters a year, it's going up. And about 0.01 millimeters a year, it's being eroded. Um, so these slopes are often constantly... Uh, charged to eject material out in the Oregon Coast Range. So here, when we're looking for a landslide dam lake, we'll go through the LIDAR. Here's a example. We have Birchard Lake. From the aerial, we can see that there's a few stumps hiding there. And we can see that actually multiple landslides have occurred on this area. But our most recent one was this guy that popped out and blocked off the creek to form Birchard Lake. So what I do is we have our lake. I put on waders. Hopefully, it gets real tough when you when it's deeper than your waders will go. Um, and I go in with a chainsaw, right? I make sure I use canola oil. I don't use bar oil in there. We're not trying to get petroleum products into the lake. And we take a slab like this, right? Perfect. These tree rings, the way we can use dendrochronology, these are like a barcode. So we can line these up with old living growth, ancient living growth trees, um, and use those barcodes to uh, line up when our lake formed. Easy enough, right? No. So we have some caveats to bring up. This was a big, big uh, learning curve the first time I went to a couple of these lakes. You go in there and you're like, oh, awesome. It, all these trees drown, right? And then you start looking around. What the hell happened to that tree? Who's nibbling on that? Beavers. Yeah, beavers like to come in. These are great. These are already marshy wetlands, so they just come in and they'll just build a dam, and then they'll kill another generation of trees. So for here, take a look at this. So I pop up, here's a wetland. I can't remember what the name of this one was, but it used to be a lake that's filled in. Whoops. Which trees died from that landslide blocking off the creek? So we have some dead stuff, or we have some snags back there, right? First time you'd walk in there, you'd be like, all right, those look like those died from a flooding event. Okay. No, those are from a beaver dam. This one here, and then one that's hiding right in there are the only original trees we get, our oldest generation of trees that we suspect were from that landslide damming event and not from beavers coming in. So there's one caveat. Some of the other caveats, like I said, since these are usually steep channels that these lakes are forming, these landslides come down uh, form these lakes in, when you get your waders on, it gets deep very quickly sometimes. So sometimes I'm literally just in a boat with a chainsaw, usually a rubber raft, because it's cheap, and you just get prepared to sink it. If you go in there with the mentality, hope for the best and prepare for the worst, you'll be okay. You sink it with a little nick, oh well, <laughs> no. Um, I took out some of the videos of 
me sampling trees because they're a bit ridiculous, but uh, uh, yeah, getting out to these trees is usually half the mission. <laughs> if you have much better funding, if you're like Brian Black or <laughs> others in Washington, you have easier access, they will actually get a couple of canoes, put a generator and air compressor on there, and they'll go underwater with scuba divers, and they'll take tree samples that way with a pneumatic saw. Um, we didn't have that funding. That seemed a lot more complicated versus just me swimming into a few places. So, um, all right, great. So we have some tree samples. We have our barcode. We have years where it grew really well, really wide rings, and we have years where it grew really So I'm gonna make some of you sad. <laughs> this is the radiocarbon curve. It is not this nice, smooth decay, no. Instead, especially after we get about 1500s, 1600s, things get real squiggly in here. And so if we were trying to date the 1700 subduction zone earthquake, it lines up with all these other points on there. So we can have 1700, we can have late 1700s, we can have some early 1800s, early 1900 dates. Um, so this is actually the same graph, just axis flipped on here. Uh, so again, we're looking at the year 1700. This is our probability, our prob ah, excuse me, probability for our different ages here. So as we can see, it lines up with not just 1700, it lines up with all these different points. So this is where radiocarbon is not great for dating the 1700 earthquake, um, especially in, with tree, using tree rings. Um, so yeah, not just 1700, radiocarbon, that's probabilistic. So we get a lot of ambiguity between 1600s and the present. Our first few lakes we went into, we thought we had 1,700 sites. We were like, yes, we're going to be famous finding these sites in the Oregon Coast Range. We found a couple of them. And then we did dendrochronology, and then we were sad on the first one. And then we were really sad on the second one. And then we just like, well, well, Will was like, well, I'm going to write a paper then on that. <laughs> so, so this is where dendrochronology is very important for us. Again, for the, especially, yeah, for the 1700s. So when we're using dendrochronology, what we'll do is we'll take those samples, we'll scan, we'll, or excuse me, we'll polish them down, nice smooth surface, we'll polish them, and then we put them into a program called uh, Coup Recorder, or Coordinate Recorder. And you just go on there, and because you scan them, and you know how many digital pixels per square inch, you can measure the ring width on these uh, remotely on your computer. So this one's from Klickitat Lake. Uh, we didn't measure the last few rings, but count a few in, and then we started putting together our growth chronology. Um, one thing you need before we start doing this, excuse me, uh, is you need old growth trees. We need a way to compare these lakes with trees that are alive or to a tree ring records. Um, this is where we're again lining up our barcode kind of is how I say it. So Oregon, Oregon coast range, our oldest trees are only about 400 years old. Um, however, if you go up to McKenzie pass, there are a couple of trees that are over a almost about a thousand years old which is very impressive for a Doug fir. Um, they're actually growing on a very, very young lava flow that came off of, um, oh, is it Collier Cone, I think? What, one of the younger lava flows, it's only a couple thousand years old. But it's such poor growing conditions that these trees have tiny, 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 tiny little growth rings in them. And that's why we can get these, what look like pretty shabby trees, but they were once tall, top broke off. I mean, they've had a thousand years of storms to deal with. Um, so we can use those tree rings uh, from those old growths to put our uh, chronologies together. So tree ring width decoding works. So we take our width of our ring. So this is modern old growth here, but we have to detrend it. So trees grow real quickly at first and then they decrease. So we smooth that out. And then this gives us our uh, ring width index. So this is our old growth tree ring width index. And these are, I mean, we can actually see climate patterns in these. That's what these big changes are. So we have our uh, tree ring index from Mary's Peak. These are about 400 year old trees. And then our first site, Click Attack Lake, we worked at. This is one we thought was 1700. We were like, yes. And then Brian showed us that, well, it's not really. In fact, it's middle 1700s. So we have a high correlation with our rings that we measured at 1741, both the t-value correlation coefficient. But remember, I, we counted a few rings in before we started measuring the widths. 
So we just count each ring out, doo, 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 doo. and then we find out, oh, the bark, our, the last year underneath the bark, it's 1751. And then we go out to, just to double check, we'll go down the forest, we'll go on the landslide deposit here at Klickitat Lake, and the oldest trees on the landslide deposit started growing around the 1760s and 70s. So the landslide came down, killed all the trees, and then you have new trees starting to regenerate at this time. So what that tells us is that Klickitat Lake formed in the winter of 1751 or 52-ish. So we can get them actually down to the season in there. So this is by far the most precise way for us to start figuring out if there are earthquake-related landslides or not with dendrochronology. Hopefully that made somewhat sense to everybody. That's, I see some nods, okay, good. So one thing happens though, or excuse me, what happens? So say our lake is older than our oldest old growth. Well, that's kind of a problem because we don't have a tree, we don't have any tree rings to compare it to or master chronology. So this is where we do something called wiggle matching. So this is where we will use radiocarbon, but because we know there's some funkiness in here, well, you just take a couple of radiocarbon samples. Well, that didn't scan over. Uh, <laughs> if you take multiple samples and then you count the, the tree rings in between, you can figure out which part of the graph you should be sitting on based on those samples. So if we take two different samples, they line up right around here, but we know there's 100 years in between or so. That allows us to more precisely figure out when those trees died using the radiocarbon. Still not as exact as dendrochronology, but it gets us in the ballpark, though. All right, so that's how we date ancient landslides. We really, really landslide dam lakes, anoxic conditions, that's really what we need to start dating these landslides. So in the Pacific Northwest though, what's, what's causing many of these landslide dam lakes? So where I started working was in the Oregon Coast Range um, with the University of Oregon. Um, we were searching, yeah, for 1700 Cascadia earthquakes. Where are they? So Oregon Coast Range, one reason it's really nice to work on is it's in what I said was, uh, excuse me, steady state topography. Um, for geomorphology, again, things are uplifting as fast as they're eroding. A lot of the watersheds though, if you look at them, are beautifully dendritic and very uniform. You, there's not really landforms from one to another that sticks out. So for geomorphology and modeling, that's perfect. Um, and so we focused, yeah, on the Oregon Coast Range, mostly central, and then a little bit into the Northern Oregon Coast Range. And so I went into all these sites, sampled them. We have a couple, very few examples of modern historic ones. And so gave this to Will for his PhD, plotted this all out. And these are all sites that we dated in here in the, the uh, boxes. One thing stuck out. Well, first, we didn't have a damn 1700 landslide. No, we found a lot of different others. Um, what we found out though was precipitation. We found out that 1890 produced more landslide dam lakes than any other in the Oregon coast range. 1890, people were there. Um, railroads were washed out. There was multiple other debris flows that formed. Um, and we found multiple other landslide dam lakes around the central Oregon coast range that all correlated with that age. And we found a few older sites too, from, or excuse me, from some older uh, flood sites. And then we just have some random ages in there that didn't really correlate to anything. So we didn't find a single 1700 site here. Well, that's kind of a story in itself and odd. <laughs> I mean, that just shows us, you know, precipitation. That's a big culprit in the Oregon coast range. Who'd have thought? Lots of rain, lots of trees, things fail. Again, how that, what's going on there, uplift is equal to erosion. So those slopes are always primed to fail. So you give them a little extra water and they will fail. Um, so another study came out about the same time we were working on this with our friend Sean Lehusen, and he does something called surface roughness dating. So this is a really cool thing with landslides where you can start to get an estimate for the age on them just looking at the LIDAR and looking at how um, rough the surface is, surface roughness dating. So a new landslide, this is the Oso landslide here, will be very rough, really hummocky, um, but over time, that signal, they will start to become more subtle and subtle. Uh, uh, things will become smooth, you'll have some soil transportation. Um, and over time, the older landslide is, the more smooth that topography is. 
until it's finally cut in again at some unknown time later, um, and a new landslide forms on the older landslide. So Sean Lehusen has worked all over the Pacific Northwest and put together some models, and he actually worked in the Oregon Coast Range after us, and he used some of our dates for our different lakes to start putting together, to calibrate his surface roughness dating model. So in the Oregon Coast Range, we have these different age sites. He pick and chose, draw some uh, polygons around them. Great. What did Sean find? So this is where things, I gotta explain a little bit. But Sean found the same thing that we did. So he produced a histogram of our different landslide dam ages in the thousand year bins. And the black line is what he observed. So why is this important right here? So 320 years before present, this is where we would expect our subduction zone earthquake. And if there was a bunch of landslides that occurred, we would expect a bump right here. And then with our others, we would also expect maybe some bump. And that's what our figure at the bottom, B and C, are showing. And his models, if so say if all landslides in the Oregon coast range were from coast seismic triggering, we would expect our surface roughness model to look like this. If 50% of the landslides were from coast seismic, we would expect this. Instead, we see this steady state model here where what's going on is we have so many uh, landslide produced, or excuse me, precipitation, precipitation produced landslides that the earthquake signal is very subtle. It doesn't produce much compared to our earthquakes. And remember, this is in January of 1700 too. It would have been a wet season. So that was very surprising also um, to see this data come out. But that's that's two different for two different forms of evidence. We came up with the same results. We're not seeing much of an increase in landslides in the Oregon coast range during earthquakes. So why is that? And what's going on? And also I'll get on to how is that different in Washington? So Central Oregon coast range landslides happen. Any precipitation you have, any big storm, they'll produce landslides. It's just primed. It's ready to, uh, uh, to erode, to fall apart. And so as we go across the Pacific Northwest, though, how do these things start to change? So we talked about Oregon, steady state topography. Now we're up here in Washington. We've had glaciers. Tectonics are quite a bit different, too. And so this is where I've taken a bunch of all of our different data of our different dated sites. And so this is distance from nearest crustal fault. And these are all sites that I have and others have dated. And so if we look at our latitude here, this is all Oregon, Oregon coast range. We're like 35, 40 kilometers often from many crustal faults. And then we get towards the Portland basin or excuse me, the Columbia, we get many more um, landslides are closer to faults, but then we, get up to Washington and you start noticing we have a lot of crustal, or excuse me, a lot of fault landslides are along crustal faults. And so what's going on here? Well, I'm glad that Walter helped me confirm this a little bit, but it's probably Silesia under there. Our good friend Silesia. You have a big, big stable block under the Oregon coast range. that's just thick and stable. Instead, once you get into Washington, it thins and you just have a lot more crustal faulting going on there. And it's those crustal faults that are important to the story that I'm going to be telling. So in Washington now, we've got uh, everybody. we got Pat and Brian. Will's the only one that gets taken out of the picture. Sorry, Will. Um, Sean and Allison done a bunch, have done a bunch of work on this. So there's a new paper that just came out where Brian Black and others, they went along the Seattle Fault and the Tacoma Fault, the Olympia Fault, the Saddle Mountain Fault zone and did a lot of dendrochronology on there. And all these areas in red are from the year 923, 924. And being on faults, it's suggested that these are all related to a crustal fault rupture. Potentially one seven low seven, or excuse me, potentially two low sevens or one larger seven, um, given the two models. But do you know how many freaking landslide dam lakes in the Oregon coast range we dated? And we found nothing that was, it was all precipitation. And then they go to Washington. They're like, oh, we found another. I was on some of these email chains. And it's like, are you serious? So what's going on there? Well, curiously, I mentioned we've got crustal faults popping up all around here. We have another second form of evidence for this too. So we're going back to Sean Luzon's uh, surface roughness models. And he handed this over to Alison Duvall's students. And they went 
and did the same thing with surface roughness dating of a bunch of landslides all over the Puget Sound area. So same, same process, surface roughness, young landslides, um, really fresh, old landslides, really smooth. You can start putting those together and modeling them. And remember I brought up the bump, that co-seismic bump signal? They found it. But theirs isn't from 1700 here. This is from the year 923. So these are two different people that have found, two different groups of folks that have been working that have found the same evidence for Seattle Fault having quite the influence on landslide in the area. This pink is actually, or excuse me, not the pink, the blue, purple, purplish. <laughs> that's, that's our uh, uh, Oregon Coast Range steady state model. So there is a change up here in Washington. Again, this is the Oregon Coast Range, what it looked like. 1700 was right there. We don't see that bump. Meanwhile, we go over towards Seattle. We see a bump right where, it's, where others have published or expect us to have a uh, crustal fault rupture. Well, that's pretty damn neat and interesting too. So let's see. Taking all the data um, that others have, myself and others, I put together all the ages that we've accumulated for the age of valley damming landslides. Um, a couple neat patterns start to pop out. Oregon, the Oregon's down in this area. So we're on a logarithmic graph. Oregon has a lot of young slides. And this is where I come back to the fact that it's always primed to fail. It's in that steady state um, topography where stuff uplifting is fast that erodes. So it's primed to just constantly fail over and over again. But once we get to Washington, we don't see that really as much. What we do see though, I mean that 923, 24 Seattle fault or uh, those fault systems all pop out together. 1700, we don't really see much. So that's very curious. Um, and what does that kind of suggest? Well, Active faults, or excuse me, crustal faults. Active crustal faults are where we need to start focusing our energy on. Before I was working in the Oregon coast range, literally just bouncing around like, oh, there's a lake, let's go hop into it. There's some trees. Oh, there's another lake, let's hop into it. There's some trees. Um, versus what we're starting to find, it's these crustal fault systems where we need to start focusing our energy at. Versus instead of our sub worrying about subduction zone earthquakes, we think. Um, so that is where our brain is currently at. And we're starting to talk about putting together another grant to start working actually in Northern California and then possibly poking around the Columbia too, um, out of Astoria. So that's what we've been finding out with our groups working around here. Um, one other thing I've been toying with a little bit, this is just some fresh data I've thrown on here, is when landslide dam lakes do form, are they stable or not? Um, this gets us out of the earthquake question. I just want to know, is a lake stable after, excuse me, a landslide dam lake stable or not? And so these are sites in the Taiyi Formation. So we're in the Eocene Taiyi Formation. We're the Oregon Coast Range. We start plotting things together and uh, using dimensionless blockage index. Uh, this is produced by Castigli and all, um, uh, some Italians. Sorry, they've got a long history there, all right? Thousands of years of history. They do great with landslide dam stability. <laughs> uh, but in Oregon, in the Oregon Coast Range, red are sites that have failed and blue are stable ones. But we can kind of start to see this pattern pop out here, um, which this is convenient. If a new lake forms, we can plug in that data, compare the volume of the dam over the height compared to the watershed area. And we might be able to actually start figuring out if this lake is going to be stable for a long time, or if we should expect maybe downstream uh, flooding in the future. Um, one curious thing I've been poking around with this too, is I was taking all of our sites and looking at the channel widths. So why is channel width important? Well, we have quite a few people up here that work on woody debris. And, oh, I took those photos out. Well, <laughs> at our landslide dam exits, or excuse me, our outlets, there's usually a ton of trees in there, a ton of wood. You can just go skip across it. It's like almost a bridge. And I'm suggesting that those are actually what help keep landslide dams stable. We have all those trees piled up at the end of it. That, that stream, when it, or excuse me, that lake, when it fills up the first time, doesn't have that chance to start down cutting and incising when you have all that wood in the way. And the reason I was playing around with different numbers, and so these are tree heights, and we kind of start to see 
something happening when we start getting above the oh, whole like uh, 20, 30 meters. Because um, once we get large enough, you know, 100 meter plus channel widths, that's where our uh, stability drops off substantially. So this is just some other thoughts that are going on in the back of my head. Um, but with that, that's where we're headed next, active crustal faults. So hope that all made sense. <laughs> Went through a lot. And thank you very much. Yeah. Questions for Logan? Lisa. Could you put up the active stressful fault uh, now? Yes. This is not updated. There's a few on there that are. It looks like a lot of them in Oregon are on the drive. Yes. Hey, can you so, repeat the question? Sorry. Lisa's done. So, yeah, you can repeat my question. So a lot of looks, looks like a lot of the faults are on the east side of the Cascades, on the dry side. Yes, that is correct. So I'm just wondering, are you heading to places in Oregon, or have you thought maybe Oregon is, like, if it's precipitation, you know, it's going to be happening? We don't have a lot of landslide, as you'd expect. Not a lot of landslide dam lakes on the east side of the Cascades. But yes, we do have a lot of active crustal faults. If anybody has sites, though, that they know of, that would be great to know about. We'd love to go check them out. Um, but we're there's been new LIDAR done. There's definitely more active faults down around south at the Klamath Mountains um, in the new LIDAR that is definitely active, um, but aren't on this. And so that's one spot we kind of want to head to. But of course, funding-wise, populations matter. So Portland area also might end up being where we uh, go back to. Because we did have several sites up around the Astoria area um, that we dated, but we didn't, didn't have a bark on the tree. That was one of the key things we needed was bark. Otherwise, you just, you don't know if that's just some, some of the rings uh, eroded off or rotted off or not. Um, so we might end up going back up here again, too. So, but, yeah. Next Chris. question. Yes, please. Logan, um, great talk. So in terms of seeing this correlation where it looks like a 1700 earthquake at any rate, doesn't seem to have produced a strong record. Yep. Whereas a crustal fall earthquake did. I was wondering if you looked at any of like shaking models in terms of looking at periodicity of the shaking, shaking intensity, and stacking that up if there's if there's data in terms of what what's a threshold you need to exceed to actually trigger a landslide. So I know others have been working on this and from what I understand oh sorry. <laughs> Crap, I already forgot that question. Uh, <laughs> so shaking, shaking, shaking intensity, yep, it, frequency yep. of the two different fault types. Yeah, two different fault types. Uh, the shaking intensity, how do they vary? Um, from what I understand, I never actually, uh, uh, I'm not much of a seismologist, but from what I understand, talking to everybody, it's like, yeah, crustal faults produce, um, let's see, what would the right word be? Would it be higher frequency, Walter, shaking? Yeah. Um, so it might be that you just have that high frequency shaking is what it takes to make things really fail. Um, I mean, we, it also might just be a needle in the haystack problem too. The Oregon coast range might have so many landslides um, that the precipitation just overwhelms the record. Um, but yeah, oh yeah, Tim, do you have a way to answer that? Oh, you have a question. Sorry, that's the so. Um, I know others have definitely been looking at this, uh, especially this. these papers just came out in the last year or, or few months, actually. And so I know lots of people are thinking about this. So, but Tim, question. Yeah. Um, this notion that like a megatrust earthquake isn't controlling landslides is a very big paradigm shift. Yes. I can't tell you for the last 20 years how many BSSA papers and uh, Nieher grants and Mendenhall postdocs that have been explicitly dedicated to, to modeling seismic influence of landslides. Yes. And, and in my own short time in Washington State of a few decades, I will say that landslides that we've seen have always been in really rainy season. Yes. Yep. So intuitively, it kind of makes sense to me that rain has a lot bigger control, a wet year has a lot bigger control on landslides than low frequency shaking out of a mega thrust. But like, I guess my core question to you is, I mean, are you talking to the seismologists in a big way? Because this, what you're saying is really antithetical to kind uh -huh. of 
where all the money's going in terms of landslides, earthquakes, hazards, chain reaction hazards, uh -huh. the NSF cascading hazards, earthquakes causes landslides, which causes cholera, which causes blah, 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 right? And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so are you guys, I mean, this is, this is kind of out there. Yes. So, so Tim was saying that this is a big change over the last few years in our mentality. Um, so when I started doing geology, we looked at a lot of landslides and we'd be like, oh, that's probably, that thing's huge. It was probably an earthquake that did that. And it's, I mean, hell, we look at the Oso landslide. That's a big earth, sorry, big landslide in a really rainy year. Um, and so I don't want to say that earthquakes won't produce landslides. That's, I was worried about that one. That's, I think you just have such a large amount of rain-driven landslides that that coast seismic ones are hidden, in, at least in Western Oregon. Um, I suspect there might be a couple there, but you, again, you might be having to go closer to the crustal faults towards the coast, actually, uh, inland. Um, so talking to the seismologists, this is a Josh Roaring question. <laughs> That's I knew you talked to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you kind of personally believe me. What's Well, it's all about how you word the grant, right? <laughs> but yeah, we, we just, crustal faults, that's where I think we have to start focusing our energy when we're looking for those. Um, so, and again, needle in a haystack problem too. So, oh, I'm cool. is, is anybody looking at size of slides or types of magnitude and what you can Maybe the debris flows are more tied to weather events. Yeah, yeah. And the actual slides are tied to earthquake events. Yeah. Is, is, in your group, is anybody looking at that kind of stuff? So we actually have, <laughs> there's not a lot of debris flows that form landslide dam lakes, just being smaller size. We have a couple, actually, um, surprisingly. And those 1890, there was a, a lot that were recorded that year with the rain um, with a couple formed landslide dam lakes behind them. But the, uh, uh, but as for sizing, um, initially Will Struble started looking at, along with um, Bill Burns with Dogami, um, and it's still a big question. Nope, that's a we still need more data, honestly. And I'm about to start going through oops, all of um, our regional data too, and start piecing together volumes, our sizes of different things, the dimensions, and oh, that's a good question though. Um, uh, yeah, do. Earthquakes or rainfall produce different types of landslides. So, but uh, Walter, sorry. Uh, could you overprint the landslide? You had that. Yes. Had that time, <laughs> 1700 to 1743. It would be crazy to think you would overprint so many. But would you be able to see that in the in, in the landscape? Uh, you had like a, like a land earth, earthquake driven landslides in 1700, but then in 1743 you had such a crazy white year that. Larger landslides basically overprinted at 1700. So, I mean, that's totally a possibility, yes. Um, we have a couple lakes. One, sorry, I'm going to go back on the questions. So Thank you. That's, <laughs> could we have an overprint? Could there have been a landslide in 1700 and then a really wet year in 1751 and it just uh, uh, hid that older landslide? So, we have a couple lakes actually where we have multiple tree ages in there. So, we can see multiple failures. Like, one was like 1200 years old and the next was like 1890. Um, so that is definitely a possibility, but again, it's with the, we have to find the tree. <laughs> That's where all of our data is coming from, at least with how I work. Um, cause I didn't put it up here, but, um, during our first study that Will Struble put out, um, we collected not just material for radiocarbon and dendrochronology, um, but we collected actually a bunch of like charcoal and other things. And we had over an 8,000 year difference in radiocarbon. That's why we like just gave up on radiocarbon. Depending on what you sample, you can get it wide range of uh, um, dates that way. But I, I agree you could definitely have an overprint. Um, but in my mentality, I'm thinking on the Oregon coast range, we've got to go right on the coast now, um, farther and farther inland. And I'm going back to that Silesia story, I think. But so. How about two more? Oh, Chris. <laughs> Madison, sorry. A... Wait, wait. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was <laughs> Thinking again on the, the overprinting question, yep. um, what's the landslide record up in Alaska 
following the 1964 earthquake. Oh, that's. I was thinking of this is if it's a good. some sort of general sense of spatial frequency of landslides triggered by a known event in yeah. the historical record, you've got this great record good. of what's the landslide frequency in the Oregon Coast Range from all sorts of causes mm. over this time interval and have kind of a, a sense of like how many needles should we expect in the haystack. That's a good. So Chris brought up uh, the 1964 uh, for um, Alaska earthquake. And there was definitely, uh, um, he's asking, could we use that here um, uh, to compare um, how many needles in the haystack or uh, uh, how many co seismic landslides occurred versus how many are just uh, uh, hidden on the landscape. For, uh, but that's, I mean, they, I know there was co seismic landslides there. Yeah, I've seen tons of photos. I think there was. I don't know about landslide dam lakes though, but that is a good place to go next. Um, I've been trying to figure out about comparing a lot of our data to other locations. I was actually going to like Italy originally and thinking about their long historical record, but Alaska would actually be great to come look at. Um, so good, good question. Got to remember that one in my brain. <laughs> in the back. Oh shoot, sorry. So, you know, the record to uh, get a, a record of the precipitation. <laughs> so the question is, have we used the tree rings, um, that little barcode in there to uh, look at precipitation record? And let's see, what else did I miss in that? And correlate the landslides to uh, uh, the wet years. So we kind of did, but it was actually more in our landslide databases where we figured out like 1890, we have all these different landslide dam lakes that formed that year. And it's like, oh. Um, in our tree ring record, it did show like 1700s would have sucked to live in in the Oregon Coast Range. Like, sorry, it was, it was a real wet time. Um, we have a few landslide dam lakes from that, but it's one of the issues with the Oregon Coast Range is our landslide dam lakes don't last a long time. They are stable. There's just so much sediment coming down a lot of these streams that they will fill in real quickly and become a marsh um, within a few decades. There's one that formed in the 1890s that you go to now that was a lake, and now it's filled in with sediment and completely full. Um, but, uh, uh, but no, we definitely use the tree ring record though, to look at climate and other things. And, um, I'm not sure if Brian Black, I know he was looking at publishing on that. Um, but it was our big conclusion though, 1700s was pretty crappy. So that's another reason why it's like pretty surprising. We don't see that co seismic landslide signal in our, uh, landslide dam lakes, but hopefully that answered your question a little bit. <laughs> but. Well, we're approaching one o'clock. Let's thank Logan one more time. We'll see you in two weeks. We'll see some of you at 3 o'clock at Cornerstone Pizza. Thank you, Logan. Good. Good. Great job. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful job. Yeah. Yeah, you got you got a lot of interest, and here's young Walter Zaliga. <laughs> A couple of final notes before we say goodbye today. First of all, yeah. thank you. Here's to you. Thank you for joining us live. Looks like we had pretty much steady 500 plus viewers watching live with us. And I'm sure many more of you will be watching the replay of this. Uh, this is the first talk we've had in a couple of months. And we will be back yeah, yeah. at it. Uh, the next talk will be January 19th, two weeks from today, whatever that happens to be, at noon. And that will be a special talk by Kelly Wall at uh, the USGS. Let me show you the schedule. So this is for those of you that just showed up and didn't see the beginning of this. So you are certainly welcome uh, to come back and mark your calendars. Friday, January 19th at noon Pacific, Kelly Wall is an up-and-coming Cascade Volcano Observatory 
volcanologist and magma petrologist, and she is collaborating now with Hannah Shamlu here. So we're excited about that. Susan Kaspari, the following Friday, January 26th. Another central geology staff member, Marie Tekach, who is our instrument tech person, and she's finishing up her PhD at Oregon State. And then uh, March 1st, the last Friday talk of the winter quarter, Anthony Schoen talking about geothermal energy here at Central. And that's just the winter quarter. Uh, there'll be five more talks uh, that will be happening in the springtime. Uh, I saw plenty of your comments in the live chat about being frustrated that you can't hear the question. Um, you're just going to have to live with it, I'm afraid. Some speakers are a little bit more slower paced and deliberate, and they can remember my reminders to repeat their questions. And some folks like our speaker today is a rather frenetic pace, and it's just very difficult for him to slow down enough to remember to repeat a question. So you're just going to have to live with that, I'm afraid. You're a fly on the wall. Hopefully the talk itself is the meat and the, the main course that you enjoyed today. And uh, I don't want to take the time to have a microphone being walked around the room and have people line up at a microphone. That's not what this is. This is a spontaneous thing. The energy is good in this room. And I don't want to, I don't want to um, choreograph what's going on in here. So sometimes the speakers repeat the question. Sometimes they don't. You're just going to have to deal with it. Um, can I say hi to a couple of you before we say goodbye here today? Uh, I'm going to see many of you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for the next letter in the alphabet, episode N, called Columbia River Gorge, and the guest will be USGS geologist Jim O'Connor. Where are you viewing from real quick before we say goodbye? The lanes in Tucson. I'm happy with the microphones, I think. I'll watch the replay. Uh, what was the black tree ring? I'm sorry, Brandon, I didn't catch it. Brandon, special shout out to you for doing the five by fives every once in a while. That really puts me at ease as I'm directing the cameras. But I, to, to get a, a, a reminder that we're good, loud and clear, that's really helpful. Stacy, hi there, Jackson Hall. That's where I got married, man. That's a long time ago now. Electric City, Washington, Marysville, Washington, Uggzegist. That's Hans in the Netherlands. Anna's in Portugal, Red Bank, South Carolina, Nanaimo, British Columbia. Steve's in the Netherlands, Squim, downtown Seattle Fault, Worthing, England, Grantville, Georgia. Goodbye from Butler, Missouri, USA, says Christopher. Costa Mesa, California. We still have more than 450, according to Letha Lee. Even Michael, who's up with me uh, in Trim, Ireland. Uh, they're about to hit the sack tonight. So sweet dreams to you, Nee, and sweet dreams to you all. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you Sunday morning uh, if you want to join us for the Ice Age Floods A to Z. Thank you. I love you and goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Anyways, I'm family talk. Don't stay in there. It's the safest place to be.